This is Frederick Foswell. Back in issue 10, Foswell worked for Jameson, but he was also working as a criminal mastermind known as the Big Man. Yeah, he wasn't very creative. Spider-Man stopped Foswell, and Foswell went to prison. Foswell returned after a year or two as a reformed man. Jameson takes Foswell back to work at Daily Bugle as an investigative journalist. This is the status quo for Frederick Foswell. Peter Parker doesn't trust Foswell because Foswell was once a criminal mastermind, and Jonah champions Foswell's redemption because J. Jonah Jameson believes in second chances. Do you trust Foswell or not? Did he really reform? Is it all a big scheme? Or is Foswell sincere? During Ditko's run, Foswell's character gave us, the readers, a new perspective on Spider-Man. You know who Spider-Man is. You trust him, but the world doesn't. Spidey saves today, and yet people still mistrust him. Nothing ever seems good enough for some people. The unfairness of that, that is a source of a lot of frustration to Peter Parker and to the reader. Foswell is exactly that. Someone who appears to do good, but you are kept in the dark about his motives, so you question him. Foswell was once a bad guy, so was Spider-Man, kind of. Foswell has a secret identity. He puts on a mask and goes by the name Patch when investigating the criminal underworld. Spider-Man obviously wears, also wears a mask. You don't know Foswell's true motives, and same goes for Spider-Man, at least from the world's perspective. Me personally? I doubted Foswell. Even when, when he was doing nothing wrong, or even when he does something good, like uh, the moment I saw him put on a mask, I thought to myself, I knew it! That mask menace! So the question is, did Foswell reform? Is he truly a good guy, or is he still the bad guy? I was so sure there'd be a twist relating to his motivation. I'll spoil it now, there really isn't. Foswell genuinely seemed to have learned his lesson and become a good guy. He's not working with any of the villains, he's not trying to set up a return for himself secretly. There is no catch. And I kept on doubting him, like nothing Foswell did was good enough for me. I thought he was in on the crimes, or working from the inside, or it was just a trick to throw you off, but... No, he wasn't. In this case, I was like Jameson. Praise to Steve Ditko and Stan Lee. This is quite advanced type of storytelling. These are children's books. You don't need to try this hard, but this is the type of stuff that really makes Ditko's era of Amazing Spider-Man worth reading, even as a grown man. Then, Ditko left the Amazing Spider-Man, and John Romita Sr. took over. I believe Foswell's character was mainly Ditko's idea, because Foswell gets no love once Steve Ditko leaves. It kind of stops making any difference in the book. He has no storylines, he doesn't get intertwined with any of the villains, he takes a back seat. There were so many interesting setups for him. Foswell was one of the first characters to figure out Spider-Man's secret identity. Granted, Peter manages to throw Foswell off for a little bit, but Foswell was onto Peter. Foswell's alias, Patch, is a character with a lot of connections, and Spider-Man doesn't know about Patch, there's a lot of possibilities with this guy. And then, in issue 50, Spider-Man No More, Foswell finally falls back into his old ways and joins the new villain, I'll get to him later. There is no build up to this. During Romita and Lee's era, the book likes to take its time to do storylines properly. The stories by this point span multiple issues consistently. So the creators understand the importance of setups and they have multiple opportunities to do so for Foswell. And they just kinda don't do that. Foswell just falls to evil suddenly. The reason is that he thinks Spider-Man and quit being Spider-Man, so he springs into action. I guess he was just waiting for the right time, that was his big plan. He doesn't really struggle with it, we don't get to see him resist temptations, so he just kinda goes back to his old ways immediately with no, no real issues. The situation is robbed of all of its drama, that inner conflict is the sweetest part of storylines like these. It's criminal how egregiously underwritten Foswell's fall is. What's worse, at the end of the storyline in issue 52, To Die a Hero, Foswell has another change of heart. He decides to try and save Jameson, and he dies doing it. It's fitting. It's a fitting end to the character in theory, but I can't help but to kind of feel disappointed by it. I, I wanted to bathe in the drama, so to speak. I wanted to see Foswell conflicted by temptation. I wanted to see him ashamed of his fall. I wanted to see those, uh, you know, like maybe he just can't help himself. Maybe he's too ambitious or it's like an addiction or maybe he needs money or he misses the respect, whatever, anything, something. It can all work as long as you take the time to do it right. Foswell should have had one of the best character arcs in Spider-Man. As of now, Foswell feels like an afterthought. Lee and Romita didn't take the time to marinate the character. And when we finally get to cooking, 
they didn't do enough to make it special. If you do a chicken, right, it's the best thing you'll ever eat. But not if you don't marinate it properly or put a bunch of seasoning on it. Just because you have chicken doesn't mean you have great chicken. And here, the Foswell storyline just kind of ended up bland. Like I said, I think Steve Ditko was the man behind Foswell's character. Stanley and Romita don't seem to know what to do with him, and they seem to have no real interest in the character. They just kind of get rid of him the first opportunity they get. At least that's how the final execution comes across to me. But it's not a total loss. The issues themselves are pretty good, and the character I was invested in is sacrificed to make the new villain seem bigger, badder, and better. Enter Kingpin. At the start of Spider-Man, Doc Ock felt like he was the big bad of the series. He was introduced early in issue 3, and that was one of the best early issues, by the way. He had a, the first two-parter in issues 11 and 12, he got the first kill of the series with Betty's brother, or at least his henchmen did, and on top of all that, he created the Sinister Six. Doc Ock brought together five of the most dangerous uh, Spider-Man villains, excluding the Green Goblin, under his thumb. You know, like, makes him a big deal. He was the hench honcho of all these guys. He was the big man. Huh. And that, I mean, he even escalated his villainy into something more personal by taking Aunt May and Betty hostage in the same storyline. Granted, he didn't mean to. Then I feel like Goblin kind of took over that spot. Goblin was the first villain not to be defeated in his first appearance. In fact, Spider-Man didn't defeat Goblin for many years. Goblin's identity was kept a mystery for a long time too. Like, it's like, we didn't find out who this guy is. It, the, it was a big part of the book. Who is the Goblin? So, you know, like, to me, Goblin came across like the second great villain. And uh, I feel like the, for the second half of uh, Stan Lee's run, the role of the main villain is given to Kingpin. Kingpin is the third great villain of Spider-Man. Kingpin is a constant threat, he keeps returning, he has a lot of issues here. He's smart, he's physically able to go to the toe to toe with Spider-Man. So far, as far as I've read, he's appeared in three arcs. Spider-Man No More from 50 to 52, Brainwasher in from 59 to 61, and the little tablet arc with 68 through 70. That's nine issues and counting. We're not even done with this guy. Kingpin has almost as many issues as Doc Ock already. Doc Ock has 10, this guy has 9. He certainly has more issues than Goblin who comes in at the pathetic 5. Now I gotta be honest, I've never been the biggest Kingpin fan. I like him more when he's paired up with Daredevil. I feel like those books get more into his psyche and the added dark tone. The added darkness in the tone feels more appropriate for the character. You can really capture that. Uh, darkness of the gangsters and mobsters. With Spider-Man, he's just kind of a watered-down mob boss. I love how he definitely comes across like a big deal in these books. You can see his men be afraid of him. Foswell, a badly handled character. His death does boost Kingpin somewhat and makes him into this bigger, larger threat. And Kingpin is drawn really well with a layer of authority. He's big and menacing and he wears a suit. He looks like he runs things. But at the end of the day, I personally prefer my Spider-Man villains flashier. Kingpin is fine, he's doing what Kingpin does. If you like the Kingpin, then this run should certainly make you happy, but the, this many issues this quickly is starting to be a bit too much for me. I don't know where to put this, but Spidey breaks into a military post. Again, just wanted to point that out. I've been enjoying Stan Lee's run on Spider-Man, as hopefully my previous videos have shown, so I just want to take some time in this video to talk about his flaws as a writer because I think that stuff is interesting. One of his great flaws is that he struggles with reasons. Things just kind of happen without proper story justifications. Like, let's look at the storyline with the memory loss. To me, the main reason to take away a memory is to explore who Peter Parker is, is, is on the inside. Take away the guilt, take away the responsibility to on the way, take away the death of Fungal Ben, take away his friends, what do we have? Who is Peter Parker at his core when there are no real outside influences? And this storyline gives us the answer. A man who stands up against Doc Ock, because that's the right thing to do. Peter Parker doesn't try to be Spider-Man. It isn't a mask he puts up. It isn't a way to make up for his previous failures. Peter Parker is Spider-Man. Peter Parker is a hero. No matter what. It's a great story that showcases his growth because he sure shit wasn't this selfless during his early days. So when he goes up against Doc Ock, it would make sense for him to gain memories back. Since it's, he has earned them. We've shown who he is. So we don't really need the gimmick anymore. But he doesn't get the memories back. In fact, he spends the next issue running around trying to remember who he is. 
How does he get the memories back? He falls into a pool of water. There's no thematic reason, there's no emotions attached to it, there's absolutely no catharsis for this free issue long thing. That's honestly something I would call straight up bad storytelling. Another way to resolve this kind of storyline would have been to do something like a scene where Spider-Man returns, Peter Parker returns home and sees Gwen and he loves her much, so much that just seeing her or talking to her would have snapped him back. Maybe she confesses her love to him for the first time and that's the thing that does it. It would affirm his love for Gwen and show just how deep that love goes that he can break through any barriers you put in their way. But no, he gets it with water and that's it. Like, what is he, a cat? The issues were fun to read, but they lacked that extra purpose that makes stories like these impactful. That special sauce that makes If This Be My Destiny and Spider-Man No More so good. In a better story, his memory returns would tie into a theme or a message or something meaningful at least, but not here. The stories of Stan Lee's era are getting more complex, and I love that, but the writing is still lacking. It does isn't up to par, at least in some of the cases. Like there are cases where he gets this is Stan Lee gets this right. Another consistent issue with Stan Lee's run has been his reveals. Norman Osborn loses his memories of being the Green Goblin in, in like issue 40. He has faint memories of something happening to him. There's this constant tension throughout the run. Norman is a ticking time bomb ready to go off at any minute and you're filled with this dread. You know things will get bad eventually, but you don't know how or when. And Spider-Man has no way to stop it except, you know, by killing Norman, which he's not gonna do. It's a fantastic source of tension. It's one of the best things going on. But then in issue 66, Norman gains his memories off panel. He even gained access to his fucking suit in, in, in between issues. Like, we don't get to see it. Like, he just has them. I don't think he has full memories yet, but he has the suit. It, it's a god of handling of the reveal. It robs the build about its climax. It's insanely frustrating. Like, what the hell? There was the Doc Ock reveal in Man on a Rampage I talked about in a previous video. Dylan's plans and motivations and traps are revealed before they happen. He doesn't know when to reveal things and when to withhold information. It's not enough to ruin any of these stories, these are still great issues. And there has been a noticeable improvement over the run in his writing, but it's still frustrating when it happens, like, mm. So much time spent on this and he just kinda gets his suit back. Ugh. The final great flaw I wanna bring up against Stan Lee is the overuse of narration. Oh yeah, this is a classic. Everybody knows this one. Romita's art is fantastic. The cr greatest crime against the storytelling here are these narration boxes and the thought bubbles that cover up that art. I mean, look at here. You have Peter and the crate on the crown. Then we move on to Mysteria, who is below the crate. It makes sense. You see the crate, you go below the crate. It's great. Uh, there's some flow there. But the crate in the image is hidden behind a fucking thought bubble. So in order to make things clear, Stanley adds a narration arrow just to explain what the art was already doing without words. Either take the balloon away, move it somewhere else, or add it in another panel with a close-up of the crate. Stanley struggles with the balloon placements. Or maybe it's Romita, I don't know which one chooses the locations of the balloons, but I'm gonna blame Stanley. There's a feeling of dread that has been building after Spider-Man No More. It feels like the walls are starting to close in on Spider-Man. Like, Foswell dies. He's the first good guy death since Betty's brother. At least I think so. I don't remember. There's so many issues that I can't remember everything that's happened so far. Dr. Strom got murdered by Osborn, but he was a bad guy. And he, even that was really shocking to see. His relationship with Gwen gets more complicated because these problems they are having are not like teen romancy little misunderstandings. Like, Gwen thinks Peter beat up like Captain Gwen Stacy. It's like really different caliber. Gwen's father is introduced and he gets suspicious of Spider-Man's identity almost instantly. Same with Robins, like these two are instantly on to Peter. Gangsters break into Peter and Harry's apartment to kill Peter, like... Like, fuck man, that's, that's hardcore shit. <laughs> it's not like super dark or anything, but there's tension. Peter's life just feels more dangerous. And you know, like you have like Kingpin who straight up name drops Peter Parker. He has a vendetta against specifically Peter Parker, not just the mask. Goblin is on his event will eventually return, and it's like there's a more serious tone to everything. Politics are also becoming a thing in these books, like in issue 68, Crisis on Campus. Oh, what a great name! There's a group of protesters. The two lead protesters are both black. They are protesting for housing for the needy. There's tension with the guards, who Peter tries to calm down by saying they're just protesters. 
the protesters are arrested and accused of something they didn't do. One of the protesters keeps calling people whiteys. And the story ends with Robinson and the protesters having a talk about working with the white man. It's pretty, like, political. It's something that hasn't happened before. Not to this extent. These issues are released in 1968, and the Silver Age of comics is coming to an end. You can see that transformation from goofy Silver Age adventures to more serious Bronze Age storylines. That raising intensity is because of the changing of the times, the writing style is getting more serious. And it's all matched by Peter's aging. He's now an adult, so his problems are far bigger and more serious, and they are more long-lasting. But I can't help but to feel like Stan Lee is to a degree struggling to keep up with the times. You can get away with a lot of sloppy storytelling when your stories are more comedic, like they used to be in early Spider-Man. But by now, because these stories are more serious and complex, and they are starting to touch some complicated topics, you can't really get away with that sloppiness anymore. After so many issues, I'm kinda ready for another writer to come in and take their shot at Spider-Man. I'm ready for Stan Lee's run to come to an end.